Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Oraculos Horary Astrology Hotline. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and as always, joining me today is my wonderful team of astrologers and friends. Hey, team. Hey, Michael. Hey, Michael. Uh, hey, everyone. All right. So in the top corner today, we have Ms. Russia Hassan. Hey there, Russia. And Hello. also, happy birthday, Russia. Your birthday was two days ago before this recording. So, Russia, super happy birthday to you. And I'm very happy that you're spending your new year here with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> you're very welcome, Russia. Down below, Russia, we have Ms. Tracy Pacelli. Tracy, how are you? I'm very good today, Michael. And right next to Tracy, we have the one and only Mr. Cameron Allen. Hey there, Cameron. Peace. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. And I think that you're feeling pretty good as well, because we tend to always do these recordings on your favorite day, the day of the sun, Sunday. So how are you? I'm good. Actually, today is the first day I didn't fast on a Sunday in a really long time. So that should be interesting. So I'm curious to see what happens. I'm excited. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Now, if you haven't watched the first episode of the Oraculos Horror Astrology Hotline, please do go and check out that episode so that you can see what it is we're doing over here. But essentially, what we're doing is taking our approach to Horror Astrology from the Oraculos School of Astrology and showing you, our lovely listeners and viewers, how we apply that to real life clients. Now, we're not pulling files from two years ago, but these are current clients who are coming with their current problems within our current astrological weather. And I think it's really special to be able to share that here with you because typically sometimes when we see horary astrology being displayed, it tends to be something that got pulled out of someone's archives. But I think it's really special for you to see how this sky that we're all living under right now has the ability to express within itself the multiplicity of human need. So if you're interested in being a part of the magic and the momentum that we're building over here on the Oraculos Horary Astrology Hotline, please make sure to go down below, like this video, as well as subscribe to the Oraculos podcast here on YouTube, and also hit the notification bell so that you receive notifications of when we bring you these videos each and every week. Now, Today, we have a really interesting horary that we're going to go into, and hopefully we can deal with two horaries. I'm going to cross my fingers about that one. But today, we're going to be doing a horary that isn't necessarily the easiest one in the world to answer. And I was thinking about it this week, and I was like, oh boy, you know, that's not really a straightforward question that I threw out to the gang. But the question for this week is essentially coming from a client who wanted to know, how can I find greater happiness within life? Now, I want to throw it out to my team and find out from you all, starting with Cameron, how might you have approached that question just within yourself? Because I know that it was a tricky question for us to be dealing with. So what were some of your thoughts in terms of how you'd approach finding what would bring someone a greater sense of happiness? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And uh, since I do, like whenever I feel like I'm in a space where of a certain uncertainty, I literally just go straight to Pluto and then I go to the nodes. I mean, obviously with horary, that's not necessarily um, my like lens or orientation. However, that is, that is what like I, I went to in the chart to check it out um, first. And then I went to like the ruler of the ascendant, of course, and then I just extrapolated from there. And I had like a lot of notes about it and a lot of curiosity about it. And I know if, when I do readings, horary readings, I'll be, I'll be able to ask questions as well. So I'm still just staying open to the curiosity of figuring it out. So that's the way I approached it. Awesome. Tracy? Yeah, I thought about happiness just, I guess, in terms of life path and how I can evolve, evolve um, uh, being here. And also, I guess, like the moon too, how I can actually manifest my needs and what would make me happy. Um, and those were probably the big things for me. 
I what I thought about is the happiness is what the soul came for to this life. So I thought if the soul's coming from the ascendant, so what is the purpose of me being here this time in this body on on earth? So if I embody myself and embody my my uh, who I am as a soul, I'll be happy. So um, I went to the first house, and what is the first house is doing? Well, I'm super happy that I heard a diversity of responses, and I definitely want to check out all of them. But what I do love is that we all had this singular theme of looking at the ascendant and really fleshing that out. Now, I was teaching class this week to a group of my first year students, and we came up against another one of these horaries that didn't seem to have the regular, you choose the ruler of the first house and then the ruler of the other house, whatever that house is. It didn't seem to really follow that same structure. And what we realized in the process of looking at that horary was that we really have to use our foundational skills times 100. So if we're going to be working with the Ascendant, how much more can we draw out of that Ascendant than what we would usually draw out of the Ascendant? Say, for example, if someone came in and wanted to know, is this person the right person for me? In which case, it's a really cut and dry sense of, I look at the first house, I look at the seventh house, I do my regular spiel, and then I come up with my judgment. When the question is a little bit more precarious, we have to use our raw foundational tools even more and extract even more information out of them in order to answer the question at hand. And for me, insofar as this question wasn't just about the happiness of the person, but it also was about purpose. What is my purpose in this current life? When a person comes in asking a question like that, what is my purpose within this current life? We always have to think about two things. Where have I come from? And where am I going? And when we can answer those two things for a person, where have I come from? The ascendant. Where am I going? The midheaven. And we can go back and forth between those two things. We can begin to develop a rich body of information to be able to give that person, even if we're not quite sure how to deal with a specific question like, what makes me happy within this lifetime or where will I find my greatest happiness? Now, another consideration that's only occurring to me after the fact, because this was a horary that I did in person for someone a few weeks ago, the obvious place where we find our pleasure and where we find our happiness and where we find our joy within the chart would be our fifth house, would it not? Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I was thinking about that too as well. But like sometimes my mind just goes in multiple places and I can hold that. And so I just don't always vocalize it. But yeah, the fifth house, yeah, I was in there. Definitely. So the fifth house could be a source of happiness for sure. And it could be the main house to which we go when we're looking for happiness and when we're also looking for pleasure. You know, what turns me on? What will bring me the greatest amount of happiness? We can also explore the fifth house, which isn't necessarily something that I did within that reading. And even though the reading did prove accurate for the querent at the time, I would like to explore the fifth house with you all here today to see if it adds other layers of meaning to the situation. Um, yes, I, I also did something too where I looked at the D12 just to see what might have also been the concern. And um, it did bring up the seventh house, which I thought was interesting. You are on the money. You are on the money, Tracy Pacelli, because this question most definitely was tied up within this person's seventh house love relationships. Now, in reference to what Tracy is referring to in terms of the D12 or the 12th divisional chart, as it's called within Geotish or Vedic astrology, or rather the Dodakatamoria, as we know it within our Western tradition, the D12 is taking the 30 degrees of a sign, whichever sign, is in question and cutting that sign into even segments of two and a half degrees each. 
And this is called the Dodecat Moria or the Dwad. And insofar as our horary astrology is concerned, we are concerned with the Dwad of the Ascendant and the ways in which the Dwad of the Ascendant can oftentimes indicate that which is hidden within the heart of the Querent. And so I'm really, really happy that Tracy brought up that concept of taking a look at the D12 because this entire thing was truly based on the state of this Querent's relationships. And the final thing that I'll throw in there is that there are some other things that we do within the chart that I'm not even sure we would have gone over within the context of our horary training, but I'm going to show you some of those things here today as we move into this reading. So let's begin. All right, everyone. So here's the chart in which the Querens asked, what will guide me to happiness? So we're going to start by going to Ms. Tracy Pacelli, who is going to guide us through our first steps that we always take over at Oraculos when we have a horary chart. Go for it, Tracy. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, the first thing we look at, we're looking at the Ascendant, we're seeing that it's in, in Aquarius and we're identifying Lord One. And what rules Aquarius is Saturn. So that we then want to uh, assess its essential dignity by looking at the sign it's in. So what I see that it's Saturn and Saturn is in Capricorn, which is an, a sign uh, of great dignity. It's its own domicile. So it's sort of like the king in his own castle. Um, so he, he feels like really comfortable. He's got the goods within himself. And that's the essential dignity part. Awesome sauce, Tracy. Now, Russia, take it away for us with what we would do next in relationship to Lord One after having assessed his essential dignity. The second we would see in which house is in, and it's uh, Saturn, it's in, uh, in his joy in the 12th house. And that means he is uh, comfortable uh, with his own skin, like whatever he, he's ready, he's, he's good in his, in, in, in this uh, uh, joy house as Saturn. Okay. Now, talk to me, Russia, about the fact that even though the 12th house is the terrestrial joy of Saturn, it's also a cadence house. And we know from our study of Renaissance astrology that it's considered to be one of the most malefic houses, for lack of a better expression. So yes, it is the joy of Saturn, but also integrate for me what it means for Saturn to be there in this cadent 12th house that we know already has this malefic connotation. Yes, so the cadent house is not doesn't have a, a lot of powers, like it has 25% power. So it's and it's cadent, so it's not the most uh, comfortable and powerful um, of, of the other houses. Now, Cameron, take it away and and give us your feeling of what it means for the Saturn to yes be in his domicile and yes be in his terrestrial joy in the 12th house, but also to be there in the cadent 12th house, given the sort of question that the Querent is asking, what will guide me to happiness? Uh, as far as it being in the 12th house, a lot of times they say it's something that's hidden. So, I mean, that makes sense automatically, right? Somebody's asking about what will guide me to happiness and whatever it is, it's hidden. They don't see it yet, right? So that's the first thing that pops up for me. And I also know it's the house of uh, self undoing sometimes. So it's like in some ways, and because like I was saying before, like I, because of my orientation to the chart, I like looked at Pluto and stuff like that um, with my, the way I do it. So it's like, kind of like worrying about it and it's not knowing what you're doing and sometimes i like to tell people i'm like if you don't know then just accept that you don't know and like keep moving forward so some just like something about like trying to grapple with it and like get like a uh, try to contain it it's 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 causing like a unraveling on, on some level is what i what i felt off of it so for me when i spoke with this client looking at the same chart the first thing that I noticed, because it is a bit of a precarious question, what will guide me to happiness? And we do have to pull out all of our skills in order to answer it. So the first thing that I noticed was that we have Aquarius rising. And we know that Aquarius is a fixed air sign ruled by Saturn. 
And when we think about fixed air, we think about a person having a very fixed framework of what their thoughts are and a very fixed framework of how those thoughts interact with the environment that they find themselves in. And oftentimes that can be one of the things that gets in the way in terms of them really figuring out what to do next. Because sometimes our thoughts come into direct conflict with the environment in which we find ourselves, which is more than often the case. Now, the next thing that I realized, even before taking into consideration the essential dignity of the Saturn, was that this Saturn is also ruling the 12th house. And I think it's very interesting when we find the ruler of the Ascendant also being the ruler of the 12th house, especially in the question like this, where he's asking, what will guide me to happiness? Now, what this is already saying to us is that my life, my vitality, i.e. the first house, is tied up with the things that I'm doing that are against myself, or it's tied up with the things that I'm doing that don't really serve me at this moment. And maybe I'm consciously aware of it because we have the rule of the first house is also the rule of the 12th house in the 12th house. So maybe I'm consciously aware of the specific things that I'm doing to shortchange my happiness and to prevent myself from really finding the sort of happiness that I want. Now, the next question we always have to ask ourselves whenever we make any sort of definitive statement is why? Why? Why should be the question that fundamentally flows underneath the fabric of every system of astrology we practice? After you say any statement astrologically, the very next question you have to ask yourself is why? So why would it be that this person is the ruler of the 12th house, i.e., also representing his self-undoing and his hidden enemies, or rather, I am a source of my own self-undoing and I'm actively engaged in those things right now that underpin the sort of happiness that I'm trying to establish for my life. That is one way of asking that question. And the next way of asking that question is, and what is preventing me from moving from this place? What is keeping me fundamentally here? Well, we spoke about that earlier because we're talking about Aquarius, is it not? And when we're talking about Aquarius, we're talking about fixed what? Fixed air. Fixed air. And Cameron, what does that fixed air feel like for you? Yes, it's fixed thoughts, but what else can you get out of trying to fix the air? Um, to me, sometimes I think of like atmospheric pressure and it just like makes one feel kind of like claustrophobic in some type of way even like when i was talking about the pluto earlier i was i even put my hands up to towards my head like that fixed city it's like not it's like feeling too boxed in kind of yeah yeah now the thing with the aquarius as a concept is that aquarius associates the fixed thoughts it has with freedom Whereas the rest of us might look at the Aquarius and be like, oh my God, you're so stubborn. You're so stuck in your ways. You're this fixed air person. For the Aquarian, those fixed thoughts are a source of freedom. So it doesn't manifest within the heart of the fixed sort of personality that there's something intrinsic within themselves that's serving as a source of their suffering. Because they're looking at their fixed thoughts and thinking, but that's who I am. I am fixed air. That is who I am. In the same way how the Leo looks at their fixed fire and that is just who I am. How can I be any other way? How can this thing that I've so deeply associated with myself also be a source of my suffering? So that's the first thing that we see in looking at the Aquarius. Yeah, I just thought I wanted to add that um, he might have a tr trouble getting out of his head um, because of that fixed air. And the fact that he's a kind of, you know, he's got Mercury, he's in the terms of Mercury. So that again would be him being in his head and that square in the ascendant. So in conflict with his head and his thoughts. Tracy, you were quite extraordinarily extraordinary.
Because yes, this ascendant is most assuredly in the terms of Mercury, which does bring out more of that mercurial effect that you're specifically speaking about. So good for noting that because yes, it does seem as if this querent is very much caught up within his head and within his thoughts and potentially his mental characterization of how things should be, is it not? Makes sense. Could I just add that since he's an Aquarius, um, fixed air could, could bend that and futuristic, he has an, an idea of what his future should be and he gets fixed about it. This is where I want to reach, this is what I want to be uh, in the future and he can doesn't know how to go around that being fixed. Well, definitely, you know, we tend to have this thought of Aquarius also being this futuristic sign. And I've spoken about that a couple of times, but I want us to bring in the Aquarian theme as as a point of interest, but let's not really, really, really delineate him, the querent, as Aquarius per se, because we know that this is the horary chart, not necessarily the natal chart. But yes, that definitely could tie into it that I have a very clear vision of where I want to see myself or how I want my life to develop or to move forward. And maybe that's standing in conflict with the happiness I'm seeking right now. Now, the other thing here is that he's ruled by Saturn. And this isn't just any sort of Saturn. This is Saturn in Capricorn, which for all intents and purposes, brings out more of the intrinsic Saturnian nature that we associate with Saturn itself. So Russia, talk to us a bit about what does it mean for this querent to be Saturn in Capricorn, given everything that we've said about the situation thus far? I would say he's really committed, committed for himself, committed to find, to reach that vision, if he had the vision of what he wanted to be in the future. And now he's in maybe in the middle of time of like seeing this is not happening or I don't know if I'm if I'm doing that I think for myself is this where is my happiness that's the question but he's committed to reach what he want to be he's uh he's working on it and he's going to continue working on it uh people say as well Saturn brings like a sense of a source of like limitations or restrictions so even coming and asking the question what will guide me to my happiness that the, the querent is probably feeling restricted or limited in some way and um, perhaps fearful also of just sort of getting out of his shell and just allowing his head to rule, which is really not always the best thing for him. Now, the Saturn in Capricorn theme as an energy is the embodiment of the phrase to be a long sufferer. And as a matter of fact, Sometimes I even joke that the person who came up with that term, long-suffering, was someone who had their Saturn in Capricorn. Because the Saturn in Capricorn is going to see the task ahead of them, or rather see the task that they're currently engaged in, and dig their heels more deeply into the certainty of that task. So there's a sense when we have Saturn in general, that Saturn feels like if I keep on doing the work that I'm currently doing, then I'm going to reach the outcome of happiness that I'm wanting to reach towards. And that fixed thought becomes a source of limitation because oftentimes when you continue to do things in the way that you're doing them, it doesn't necessarily lead to freedom. The Saturnian person has the ability to take upon themselves this burden of staying where they are because it's tried and true. And it doesn't matter what the future is calling upon them to do. There is a sense when we have Saturn and Capricorn that the past is really reassuring. Where I've come from is really reassuring. And the comfort that I'm able to establish within myself as a result of my relationship to the past becomes so reassuring that I would rather continue to move myself through the very specific pattern 
that I've always moved in because if I keep on doing these same things, then I will ultimately attain the results I'm looking for. Yeah, it's like the devil we know. The devil we know. Yeah, so when I think about Saturn, I often think about the word perseverance. So people just having perseverance uh, comes into play. And I also, because of that thing with Saturn, I often talk to people about like making sure that they focus on understanding and mastery because it helps to keep them away from just being so fixed that they don't see that they're not completing the task fully in the way that it just like needs to be completed. So the composite image that we've built for our querent with Aquarius rising, Saturn at 25 degrees, Capricorn 24 minutes in the 12th house, in domicile, in Capricorn, in the 12th house, also ruling the 12th house, is that here is a person who is coming in with a very fixed perspective about how his life should be based on what his life has been. And because of the level of comfort that Saturn already has in the 12th house by being in his terrestrial joy there, I am comfortable being in the situation that I currently find myself in. However, because the 12th house is a cadent house, and we know that the 12th house on our list of houses by way of the power that they have, our 12th house has the least amount of power, so because the 12th house is a cadent house with the least amount of power, even though I'm comfortable being myself here, even though I've established a sense of familiarity in terms of being here, I still don't have the environmental strength or the environmental power to mobilize the magic that is within me to do the things that I'm wanting to do now at this moment. Because the ruler of the ascendant is also the ruler of the 12th house, we know that there conception about things may be what's getting in the way of them actually finding the sort of fulfillment that they're looking for and that they may be underpinning their own happiness actively. So not necessarily that things within my environment are taking away from my happiness, but me and the sort of fixed air Saturnian patterns that I find myself in are patterns that I've developed such a great amount of comfort around because we know the 12th house is the terrestrial house of joy for Saturn. So not only are those patterns something that I've developed a deep sense of comfort around, those patterns may be things that I'm deeply committed to and deeply invested in. And so I, as the querents, need to take a look at my deep investments of time and energy and where I'm allowing myself to be rooted and placed within the world because that place where I currently am is a place that isn't bringing me the happiness that I'm looking for. And furthermore, if we go to Betham Santiloquium, we know that Betham says that a planet cadent is like a man dead, having no motion. So if it is that this querent is wanting to act and their fulfillment of their happiness is as a result of them doing something, we know that their placement in the 12th house, though in domicile and in its terrestrial joy, fundamentally shortchanges their ability to act because we know that planets in the 12th house have the least amount of power to do or to express whatever it is their promise is. Also, in conclusion of taking a look at this Saturn, we know that Saturn, though in the 12th house, is in his domicile. And Betham in his Santiloquium says that a planet in its domicile, however cadent, is like a man who is locked within his own home. So once again, that furthers our concept that the Saturn is indeed comfortable where he is, i.e. our querent is indeed comfortable where he is. However, he is locked within his own home. And if the fulfillment of his happiness has to do with him going beyond himself and reaching out into the world to do anything at all, we can see here that based on the disposition of him in relationship to the things that he's comfortable doing, he doesn't have the power to mobilize himself beyond that place. And furthermore, the inertia that comes over anyone by virtue of them being comfortable is preventing him from even feeling as if moving is something that's really, really necessary, even though he knows that moving is something that he wants to do. Whew. 
I love that Michael locked in his own home. That's I what it, it is. I, lo I, lo I love this one. Now, since we are still trying to use our ascendant for everything it's worth, and we're operating under the assumption that we don't necessarily know which other house to go to, even though I said before that my next place would be to go to the Midheaven, let's continue to operate under the assumption that we're not sure what is the appropriate course of action to take next. The next thing that I would do is I would take a look at the planets that are an aspect to the Ascendant and see whether or not those planets that are aspecting the Ascendant has any information to give me before I go on to finding the next house lord or even before I go on to the assessment of the moon. So the first thing that I see here in terms of tight aspects to the Ascendant is that we have Uranus casting its square to the Ascendant and that while it has separated from the square, because of retrograde motion, Uranus is reapplying to that exact square of the Ascendant. And the other thing that we see is that we're also having the Mercury having its square to the Ascendant as well. So, Cameron, talk to us about what do you think Uranus squaring the Ascendant may mean in relationship to the Quarant? Uh, when I sat down with this, it was just like, there, was, there might have to be like, um, cha like changes or like, like um, a swift change in like thought processes uh, like just a change in direction and thought process. And then, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I, what I attuned to when I was looking at that. Now, before we go on, I'll tell you something about Uranus in general, but specifically about Uranus in relationship charts. Whenever we find Uranus in the seventh house in relationship horary, and this aphorism is coming from Rupertus Stella in his book, The Astrologian's Guide to Horary Astrology. Whenever we find Uranus in the seventh house in relationship to love or relationship horaries, Rupertus Stella tells us that it indicates the ending of that relationship or the severing of that relationship. For all of the Uranian words we can think about, Uranus is about liberation and about freedom and about radical severances and about tearing things down so that new things can arise. So for all of those Uranian reasons. Now, we do not specifically have a Uranus seventh house relationship within this particular chart other than the fact that Uranus, by virtue of being in square to the Ascendant, it's also in square to the seventh house, but that's given. But that's given. And we can take something that's given, like the fact that Uranus is forming a T-square between the Ascendant and the Descendant, and make that relevant. The only thing we can make this relevant for is Uranus in terms of its relationship to the Ascendant. And what that can mean is that Perhaps the Quarant has recently gone through a Uranian experience comparable to a breakup of some sort. Or perhaps the Quarant has recently undergone some deep Uranian change that has taken away or rather ripped away the foundation that he probably was previously accustomed to. And as a result of that foundation that he was previously accustomed to being ripped away from him, he finds himself now being Saturn in the 12th house in Capricorn, wanting to dig his heels even more deeply into the ground in revolt of that change that he's recently undergone. I can tell you that the Querent, after bringing that up, he said that he had just been through a breakup with his ex-girlfriend, and that was the recent Uranian change that would have occurred within his environment and within his life. Russia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Is there anything else noteworthy you'd want to say about that? Uh, that he is ready for change, that he is, uh, there is a wake-up call happened, something happened in his environment, that is a wake-up call of like, where am I? 
Where is my happiness? Where should I go next? And that is very powerful because we all know how Uranus and, uh, is, is powerful when it's going to touch the ascendant or any other significant um, uh, location or, or doing any aspect with any other significant planet. So just looking at uh, Uranus being across from Mercury and then thinking about Mercury being parallel the ascendant, I was just feeling into that. And then also since you said something about a breakup, then... I mean, I don't like in because I'm still cultivating like how I'm gonna do horror charts, but it's like what it what had to do with the communication there, you know, something about like the communication feels pr- prevalent. Yeah, I was also um, just sort of curious because Uranus is actually, you know, heading toward the ascendant that it's applying toward it. If there's still going to be some piece of information that he hasn't quite received yet that he's about to, that's going to shock him or change his course. Well, let's hope that the reading that he received was the Uranian thing. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. That that shocked him and that changed his course. And so what Cameron was referring to in terms of the Mercury being parallel the ascendant was that here we have in the declination table, we have Mercury is at 18 degrees south, two minutes. And we see that the ascendant is at 18 degrees south, eight minutes. So we basically have a Uranus ascendant conjunction. But as if we needed anything else, we also have the midheaven tied up in that because the midheaven is at 18 degrees south, 18 minutes. So what we see is that this Mercury is pulling in both the ascendant and the midheaven, which is a nice piece of information because we were already going to go to the midheaven in any event because of the way in which the midheaven serves as a general direction within the life of a person. And here we see Mercury tying all those things in. Mercury, which is operating from the ninth house. Now, curiouser and curiouser. Tracy initially said that the Mercury was important because the ascendant is in the term of Mercury, which is correct. And Cameron pointed out the fact that the Mercury is made even more so important because the Mercury is parallel the ascendant which is also correct so cameron i'm going to throw it back out to you and i want to know from you where is the mercury operating from first of all i.e what is the terrestrial placement of this mercury and what might that have to do with the price of milk in china go for it so mercury is in the ninth house so there's something about his, the way that he's mentally organizing his beliefs that might be emotionally abandoning to himself. That's the way I would, I would read that. Now, the other thing that we know about the ninth house in general is that the ninth house has to do with higher education. Is it not? So we have the ninth house as being a house of higher education, being a house of higher learning, a house of university education, a house of us being students again, adult students again. And we see this Mercury paralleling the Ascendant, which could be saying to us that, hey, there is something within this chart or there is something hidden within this chart, because as we know, a parallel versus a contra-parallel, they aren't the most obvious aspects in the world. We have to go searching for them. So what that could be saying is that there's something hidden within this chart that is drawing this querent to pay attention to his ninth house affairs. That could be the first thing. Also, we have the Mercury-Uranus opposition from the ninth house and the third house. And we know that the third house has to do with our foundational education in life, whereas the ninth house has to do with our higher education in life. So we have the educational axis being drawn strongly in to this Quarant's affairs. And we have both the Mercury and the Uranus in aspect to the Ascendant, which means they're bringing forward this theme of how am I being educated even more strongly? And am I receiving the sort of education that I really want? Is this a part of my life that I should specifically be focusing on? Or 
if I'm looking for what will guide me to happiness and I'm waiting for the lightning to strike, i.e. Uranus, I'm waiting for the lightning to strike to bring me the revelation within my mind about what I should be doing next, Mercury Uranus, is it that the lightning has already struck between my ninth house and my third house? And what's really being brought up for me is I need to be a student again. I need to educate myself. I need to focus more specifically on that. I would add maybe also liberating my mind, liberating my capacity and not and, and start to broaden my knowledge broaden my uh perspective of, of uh, other things in my life and um i would also add to that because yeah i think broadening too is it, that's great but also because that mercury seems to be peregrine that it's sort of lost and in scorpio wanting to find a direction so perhaps through higher education that focus can become clear. Now, I'm going to throw it to Cameron because Cameron and I, we were thinking about something in a pretty uncanny way earlier that we probably should have been looking at the fifth house to begin with insofar as the question is, what will guide me to happiness? Now, Cameron, we're talking about this Mercury and we're talking about the relationship that Mercury is having to the Ascendant, what is Mercury's relationship to the fifth house and how does that add another layer of meaning to our entire delineation? Yes, uh, like I was saying, the Mercury, well, anyway, the, the fifth house, uh, well, the first to, for, to go all the way back, when I was talking about how like my orientation to the chart and I was like, Pluto in the nodes is what I do. So it's like going to the fifth house, the North node, being ruled by that Mercury, it's like going in that direction, you know, going in that direction uh, is is a way that I like look at it. And also it's like they have, ple they get pleasure from learning, like from gathering data and information and stuff like that. They like, it's pleasurable for them and they feel, yeah, they feel happy, happy doing that, you know. Can I ask something? Go for it. I think also that having the South Node in Sagittarius is getting rid of like the certainty the certainty of what they what their environment instilled in them the certainty of knowledge or the certainty of uh belief uh, and broaden that uh knowledge well that is really interesting and i love it <laughs> now this mercury being in this ninth house ruling the fifth house is really the missing element. And I have to be honest with you, there were some other funky things I did to come to the final conclusion that dealt with the planetary hour ruler and the part of fortune. And that's how I came to my conclusion that we're talking about a third house, ninth house situation. But notice that if a chart is going to say something to you, it's going to find many ways to say it to you. And that is what we're seeing here right now. So let's investigate this a bit. We have Mercury, the ruler of the fifth house in the ninth house, which says that my pleasure or the fulfillment of my pleasure becomes a ninth house endeavor. My pleasure or the fulfillment of my pleasure is caught up within the reality of my higher education or of me expanding my mind and focusing on my higher education in a deep and a meaningful sort of way. Now, Tracy points out the fact that this Mercury was peregrine and peregrine means that the Mercury is having no intrinsic power within itself. So it's having no domicile rulership or exaltation rulership or triplicity rulership where it is at 10 degrees of Scorpio Mercury is in the term of Jupiter. So Mercury also isn't having any term rulership. And at 10 degrees, nine minutes of Scorpio, our Mercury is in the face of the sun, which means that Mercury is further not having 
even the lowest level of essential dignity. So it's a peregrine Mercury. So yes, this Mercury is hungry for information. We can say hungry because Mercury is in a Mars sign. And we know one thing about the ancient Roman god Mars is that he had an appetite. So we have this Mercury that is hungry for information, and he's hungry in the ninth house of higher education. So possibly the Quarant is wanting to fulfill a need within himself or a hunger within himself to pursue a higher education for himself. Now, the other thing that is going on here that Cameron mentioned was that Mercury is also ruling the North Node, which is in that fifth house. Now, that's not really something that I would usually pay that much attention to, but in the spirit of if a chart is going to tell you something, it's going to tell you it in multiple ways. That can also be a further corroboration of the fact that this Mercury is what will bring me pleasure. And this Mercury is located in the ninth house, bringing me pleasure from continuing to pursue my higher education. Yeah, you were talking about uh, the hunger, you know, the hunger th piece. And then so Mercury being in a place that's hungry. And if you think about the North Node and it's the mouth and it's like it's, it's like it's it's insatiable type of thing going on there. So that just another reflection of how the charts will show you many things, you know, even from different perspectives. I would add one thing as well. I think this is my feeling that he came to you to have this question. He's ready to be enlightened, to have and to intake a new and different information, of, uh, different than, than his fixed way of looking at stuff. He is ready. Now, something interesting that I want to bring our attention to before we go to the moon because as we know the moon should have been something that we spoke about a couple topics ago but before we go to the moon i want to bring your attention to the parts of fortune because that is where i went within this chart to talk about what it is that would bring him pleasure or what it is that would bring him happiness the physical expression of his happiness or of his emotional fulfillment. Now, for those of you who don't know, the part of fortune is essentially a sensitive point, And we find the part of fortune in the daytime chart, as this is a daytime chart with the sun above the horizon, by taking the degree of the ascendant in zodiacal longitude. And in zodiacal longitude, we have eight degrees Aquarius here. So that would be 308 degrees in zodiacal longitude. And we add that longitude to the degree of the moon in a daytime chart and here we have the moon at one degree cancer which would be 91 degrees in zodiacal longitude so we have 308 degrees zodiacal longitude plus 91 degrees in zodiacal longitude and we subtract from that the degree of the sun which is 15 degrees of libra which would be 195 degrees in zodiacal longitude so Ascendant plus moon minus the sun gives us our exact degree of our part of fortune in the daytime chart. And here we have the part of fortune in the ninth house. Now, I recently heard a friend of mine, John Frawley, refer to the part of fortune as essentially a place where a person's hunger is fulfilled. And so the reason I went to the part of fortune is because the part of fortune is indicating in the chart where the question is, what will guide me to my greatest happiness? Of course, I want to see where your part of fortune is, because that's going to give me intimations as to where your hunger will be fulfilled. And here we have his hunger being fulfilled in the ninth house of higher education. So we have even further corroboration that what we're speaking about is a ninth house thing that's going to really turn this person on and that he's primed and ready to receive that food or that nutrition that he's looking for to really get him out of the very fixed Saturnian funk he finds himself in at the moment. Does that, the having it on the 24 degree combustor, the combustor, would it then affecting that, that thing? Well, the 24th degree of Libra is within the range of our via combustor, which is from 15 Libra to about 15 Scorpio. But the 24th degree of Libra is also a very important fixed star. 
Do any of you know what it is? Speaker. Yes, speaker. Yeah, speaker. Most definitely. Speaker, spiker, Peter Piper, pick the pack of pickle peppers. Yes. <laughs> it is most assuredly our fixed star. I call it spiker. You call it speaker. Spiker, speaker. And that is a very fortunate fixed star to be on because it is a fixed star of supreme benevolence. And it's considered to be an accidental dignity when you have any planet or the specific planet that is being brought within the question being conjunct spiker. And so here within this chart, we see that, which is a further testament that my greatest happiness or the greatest unfoldment of happiness for me is going to come from pursuing whatever my part of fortune is on. I've, I heard Nina Griffin says, spiker is like bread. Is like how we get fed, what we can what we can eat to to survive. So that's so amazing that you know this is how I need to survive is getting information. That's my bread now. There, there's a lot of hunger. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. So here we have my nutrition is coming from where I have my part of fortune. I am being fed from where I have my part of fortune. And so that brings out furthermore this concept that I will be fed if I pursue this ninth house inclination of mind, which is to find higher education. Now, on that same note of finding higher education, remember earlier I said to you that if someone came in asking what will guide me to happiness, I also want to take a look at their midheaven because the ascendant is where you came from within this world. The midheaven is where I'm going, or rather, put differently, the ascendant is my immediate environment at this moment, because we could very well look at the IC as being where I came from, because the IC is our root within the chart. So, you know, let's make it up on the spot. The IC would be my roots within the chart. Where have I come from? The ascendant would be my environment that I interact with now. Where am I? And how is that environment impacting who I am? And the midheaven is, where am I going? Where will I find the most amount of fulfillment? Now, let's take a look at this midheaven. And Cameron, talk to me about the ruler of his midheaven. The ruler of the midheaven is in the third house because whenever we look at any planet that's uh, close to the five degree mark uh, within going into the next house, we just move it over into the next house. And that, so that would make it cadent. Uh, so it doesn't have a lot of environmental power in the place that it's in again there. Um, yeah, that's that's really what. And then in retrograde, so it's like some delays going on as well. And let's talk about Mars being in the third house, also ruling that third house. And what might the third house have to do with this pursuit of happiness that he's currently asking about? Essentially, I would look at that as like reviewing uh how they want to assert themselves in in getting more uh or like going into like in, in from getting information or their foundational knowledge on things to move towards uh higher learning could have been having as well this mars retrograde and so you said is like a man sick in his own home mm -hmm. i don't know how you would tie that then having it it's, it's the ruler of the mc well, here are two things that are coming up. The two things that are coming up is that this Mars, by virtue of the five degree rule, as Cameron rightly said, is operative from the third house because he is literally within one degree of the third house cusp. And within the context of Renaissance astrology, we would say that this Mars has already given over himself or he's already given over his power to that third house. Now, Another reason why this Mars stood out for me was because this Mars was the planetary hour ruler. Now, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, And in the actual reading, 
I didn't even take into consideration the fact that Mars ruled his 10th house. In the actual reading, I got a question like this, what will guide me to the greatest happiness? And I was like, oh shit, how do we answer this? So what I actually did was I focused on the ascendant ruler, I focused on the planetary hour ruler, and I focused on the parts of fortune. But I want you to notice how doing it that way or doing it the way that we're doing it today still bring us to the same houses and it still leads us to the same conclusion. Yes? Even if we include the fact that the moon is operating from the fifth house, it still would have brought in the fifth house as a factor. So once again, if a chart is going to say something, it's going to say it in multiple ways. So with this Mars here, what we have is Mars in the third house. And so my statement to him was, you're hungry for information, you're hungry for knowledge, and you're hungry to sharpen up your foundational information right now, but you feel as if there are things that are pulling you backwards. Where do we get the pulling me backwards theme from? We get that from the retrogradation. So yes, I have this deep Mars and Aries hunger to attain the sort of information I'm looking for right now. I'm hungry for knowledge. I'm hungry to learn. Mars in the third house. But I'm retrograde. I'm being pulled backwards. I'm not really having the power within myself to mobilize this right now because of situations beyond my control at this moment. Now, speaking about situations beyond my control, uh, Cameron, what do you see is the closest aspect happening to this Mars? I see Pluto immediately. And, uh, and then I also see uh, in the declination table, Mars being uh, contra-parallel Neptune as well. So those are both overwhelming forces. You got it. You hit the nail on the head. I wasn't even going to the declination table just yet because I want to give the people time to process and assimilate, but you got it. We have the plain Jane obvious aspects that we can see is we have our Mars is in a tight square, the tightest square possible to Pluto and Mars is continuing to apply to Pluto by virtue of retrograde motion. So what that is saying to us is that while the pursuit of higher education is something very important to me, or rather, while the pursuit of foundational education is really important to me, I'm being pulled backwards by forces beyond my control, forces that I can't really do anything about right now within my life that aren't allowing me to be great and that aren't allowing me to show my stuff. And what he said to me was, yeah, that's actually true because I have my job and I have my career. And so completely pushing the breakup aside, my job is fully taking up all of my space and all of my time. And it's not allowing me to finish my university degree. And my university degree is really what turns me on because that's really what I want to be doing. And I don't really want to be working in this Apple store that I find myself working in right now. That isn't the be all and end all of my happiness. I actually want to go back to school and finish up my degree. And I only have one more year left, but I'm so caught up in the fabric of work. I'm so caught up in the monotony and the certainty of work that my work has taken up all of my space and time. And it's consuming my energy and my ability to actually show up in the degree that I'm still waiting to complete. Now, Cameron, you're the one who pointed out this beautiful Mars-Neptune combination. So what effect, if I use Mars as the singular representation of his job, his career within this chart, what effects do you think Neptune has on that job or on that career in terms of this Mars that we already see in an exact square with the Pluto? Yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind is just more over, like overwhelm for or and also it could potentially be forces that whether they are or not, they feel beyond his control or his yeah, his control. Yeah, so that's what I feel off of that. And it's like a po like it's the Mars it's Mars wants to go in a direction that's already retrograde. And then there's like these forces that are like overpowering. So it's just like double time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if uh 
you know, that Mars Neptune, it might mean that something um, is happening with that job that's going to dissolve it, forces beyond his control, that Mars squaring Pluto, um, that that job might actually uh, implode, explode, um, end in some way. What I think is really interesting here is that with the Mars Pluto, we see this job is taking up so much of my time. This job is dragging me to the underworld. This job is really consuming my energy and my passion and my everything right now. And I really want to focus on my ninth house affairs, but I find myself being dragged under by this job. I find myself having even fears surrounding this job that that if I shift my relationship to this job, I also shift my fundamental relationship to security. And so we see the Neptunian impact coming in by declination here that I have confusion surrounding what do I do in relationship to my job when juxtaposed against the backdrop of the higher education that I'm actually wanting to pursue. Do I allow myself to continue to be bullied essentially by this job, or do I allow myself to continue to have all of my time and effort and energy consumed by this job without actually focusing on the things that really bring me pleasure and that really turn me on and that really have the ability to feed me? Where do I go in relationship to this job that I'm wanting to create space in my life around? And how do I say to this job, hey, Give me some space so that I can continue to focus on pursuing my higher education, which is really the thing that brings me a great amount of pleasure and happiness right now within my life. After shooting blind in this chart, we saw that the chart ultimately brought us copious amounts of information, not just about the disposition of the querent and where he currently finds himself in and the sort of situation he currently finds himself undergoing, but also about the thing that will truly bring him happiness, which we saw was completely tied up and wrapped up within this third house, ninth house axis. And ultimately, the sort of relationship his job was having within the unfoldment of all these things. So thus far, it seems as if we've given the querent far more questions <laughs> than we've given him answers. But what we have done is we've illuminated what will guide him to happiness. And we've also illuminated some of the things that will get in the way or some of the things that are currently getting in the way of him finding said happiness. And it's oftentimes very necessary for us to give people that sort of information so that they can contextualize for themselves how will I move through this situation I currently find myself in. Now that I've had someone, a random stranger who knows nothing about me, tell me the thing or the seed of my deepest and greatest happiness, which for this querent was actively fulfilling his higher education and fulfilling his obligation to himself to complete his degree. Now that I've had that reflected back to me by a complete stranger, how do I orient my life in the direction of getting that thing done. Now, I know that we are saving for last what we should have actually have done in the beginning, but when we take a look at the moon as a final fact, so we see that the moon is at one degree cancer. The moon is in domicile here within the fifth house. And the moon is not only just highlighting the fifth house for us, but the moon serves as an indication of what happens next within the life of this person. When we look back into antiquity, we see all of our traditional sources saying that the last aspect of the moon represents what happened before, whereas the next aspect of the moon represents what will happen next. So here we have the next aspect that this moon is going to make is going to be the moon's forward sextile or rather the moon's sinister sextile to Venus, who is in fall, but Venus nonetheless. So the moon applying to Venus by sextile says that the next thing that will be happening within the Quarant's life is his movement 
towards the thing that Venus rules. And here within this chart, we see that Venus is ruling the fourth house, which is rather non-dimensional within the grander scheme of everything we've already said. But specific to what we did say, Venus is ruling the ninth house. So that gives us the information that the next thing that the Quarant is going to be focusing on specifically is his Venus. And for all intents and purposes, maybe his Venus is in shit shape because it's Venus in fall. So maybe he has dropped his relationship to his education for a long period of time. And perhaps it does require some turning on of the old mill to get himself back in the grind of being back in school again. But for all that it's worth, the sextile between the moon and Venus is a positive indication of what's going to be happening next within his life. And we love when we see those sextiles. Now, the other thing that we see going on with this Venus when we take a look at our declination table is that that Venus is in contra parallel to the part of fortune which is even further confirmation that where that part of fortune is, is caught up with that Venus, which is already true because where that part of fortune is, is caught up with that Venus insofar as the part of fortune is being disposed of by our Venus. Now we can draw in all sorts of things about the Venus in the house of relationships and how that impacts everything we have going on as well, because when the chart speaks, it speaks copiously. And it doesn't just speak about one thing, it speaks about many things. But for all intents and purposes, in terms of coming to the conclusion of this and giving our client a resource that he can tap into and use, we can say to him that the next aspect this moon is going to make is going to be to that Venus. You're going to find yourself moving back into your pursuit of higher education, it may feel rough. It may feel like it's taking you through the valley of the shadow of death because here you have yourself very comfortable just showing up at your Apple job every single day, living your best life and making your money and going back home. So maybe reintegrating this Venus into your series of daily routines is going to be a little bit scary. But when you do that thing and when you really allow yourself to follow that thing, that thing that you're following becomes your bliss that you follow. Because once again, we find our part of fortune conjunct spiker in the ninth house. So Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fare no evil, because ultimately the final outcome of all of this is that in fulfilling this ninth house imperative that I have within my heart, I will fundamentally also find my greatest happiness right now at this moment. And who doesn't love a happy ending? Just what I also wanted to say was um, that it just seems in this case also so clearly is that his head is leading him in the wrong direction and his heart is is leading him in the right direction that moon is in cancer it's dignified it's in the fifth house um which is a house of good fortune um so that he should follow his heart and not his head <laughs> beautifully stated uh yeah i love i love all this and i just love there's so many different ways to get to all the same things, you know, Ugh, astrology. I, I just love it. That's really all I'm, I'm digesting it all. I just love really how we can see everything and how we can see it in different ways and uh, how we can, yeah, it's just beautiful. And that's about it. I just want to do this maybe well, not maybe, but at the end of each one, and I mean, off like not necessarily on the recording or whatever, but what I was looking at was the ruler, because I still have my modern brain, so it's like the ruler of the ascendant was Uranus in the third house, retrograde, right? And then, so, and, then, and that's why I was going back to like Pluto in the nodes, and so it's like in the ascendant is what I said, right? So it's like Pluto in the 12th house, like confusion, confusion and then uh the ruler of the ascendant being in the third house uranus it's like needing like um update his way of thinking uh update his way of thinking and then the south node being in sagittarius in the 12th house 
and he's confused from like old beliefs in the past. Um, and then the North Node being in the fifth house and then the ruler of that being in the ninth house. And it still like brings literally everything in. So I'm just stating that because if, if this happens 20 more times, then I'm just going to start <laughs> calling traditional astrologers out and show them how. <laughs> it comes in all directions. I'm yeah. But I don't know if it's true yet. Thank it's you. So thank you. Coming, because I, this is what I wanted to say, but I didn't know how to, to say it. It's like I'm, I'm rethinking of what I was learned, like, you know. I'm um, just mm -hmm. like, exactly what I wanted to say. You said it, but I didn't know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, I, f I find this in a lot of ways and, and I am learning how to say it now because I can see it in my head, but then it'll be like 20 different things. And I'm like, if I say that, then somebody's just going to like go downstream. So I'm trying to make sure I still like stay in the context of the horary as much as possible so that I can bring in the potentiality later if it's really true i don't know if it's true yet so yeah mm -hmm. but mm. tracy my my problem was with that mars neptune oh i just kept thinking of draining and i didn't get to the confusion and that's mm -hmm. like really what i should have gotten to that was one big word i was thinking about with the neptune too that i didn't yeah get to yeah yeah but, i mean i just like i was continuously reading the chart based off of just how i see charts too and then i was like this is the same thing I got to I got to yeah. I got to <laughs> make sure I hone it in first and then I could do that. Yeah. Because if I don't hone it in then camera land. <laughs> All right everyone. Uh another day, another chart and we did it. I'm super happy and super thrilled to be able to come here and share the Oraculos Horary Astrology Hotline with all of you and to also be here with my amazing team of amazing astrologers. If you want to continue to follow the work that we're doing, please feel free to go down below in the description box and check us out on social media because there is some place where you can get in contact with each and every one of us to connect with us and our our amazing astrology practice. So until next time, I am your host, Michael A. Bryan, and I've been joined today by the beautiful Ms. Rasha Hassan, Mr. Cameron Allen, and Ms. Tracy Pacelli. And we are wishing all of you lots of love, lots of hope, and peace until we meet again. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Yay, we did it. All right. Wow.